Good morning, Parkview family, and thank you for joining us today. You may have started having some conversations about how Easter is going to look different this year. Well, we are excited to let you know that we are partnering with 252 Basics to offer a family Easter experience called Easter Jam 2020. We will post some things on our social media sites this week that will kind of give you an insight of what to expect, but the actual link for the video will be posted on Saturday. This is a great time for families to come together, whether you have preschool age kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, junior high or high school, this is a fun family experience to uh, come together and make some memorable moments for Easter this year. For the month of April, our kindergarten through fifth grade are turning things upside down and we're learning about humility, how to put not our needs and wants first, but others that are in our lives. And what better example do we have than Jesus? They will be looking at Bible stories each week that shows how Jesus was able to put others first. Our nursery and preschool age students are looking at how Jesus is alive. When we go outside for walks and uh, we see spring all around us, we see trees budding, we see grass growing, and things are alive. And just like that, Jesus is alive. So the next four weeks, they're gonna dive into Bible stories that show to them how Jesus is alive. Now it's time for worship. Good morning, Parkview. Thanks for joining us this morning as we begin to worship. Precious is the blow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, I have washed, I have washed, I'm drenched in love. By the blood of the Lamb, I'm not a slave to what once held me damned. How beautiful that cleansing blood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Oh, precious is the blow that makes me white as snow.
said Lost to that hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed only beauty
was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. For the past two weeks, we've been doing a version Bible study, and it was asked in one of the devotions that we just take one minute to be still before God and let Him speak to us and let us be able to cast our cares upon Him. And since that Bible study, I've been using that one minute, and sometimes a little bit more, to do just that. So I set my timer on my watch, and sometimes it goes a minute, sometimes it goes a couple minutes, and during that time, I try to listen to God. And it's been the way I've been preparing for the day. And this word prepare, I tell you, it's just been bouncing around in my head for the last two weeks. Because we're living in a weird time when it comes to preparation. See, I can prepare easily for my day, but in this shelter in place world, how do I prepare for next week? How do I prepare for a month or maybe even two months? Because we don't know exactly what's going on. And so I've been thinking, how do I prepare? How do I work my head around all this? But then I came upon a scripture in Job chapter 11, 13 through 19 that says, if only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer. Get rid of your sins and leave all iniquity behind you. Then your face will brighten your innocence. You will be strong and free of fear. You will forget your misery. It will be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Even darkness will be as bright as morning. 
Having hope will give you courage. You will be protected and will rest in safety. You will lie down unafraid and many will look to you for help. But the wicked will be blinded and they will have no escape, their only hope and death. So how do we prepare? Well, we prepare our hearts and we prepare our minds and that's what we're doing now in communion. And what Job didn't have at that time, we have now where it says, get rid of your sins. Well, how do we get rid of our sins? We get rid of our sins by Jesus going to the cross and conquering sin and death for us. And so now what I ask that we do is we prepare our hearts and minds to remember just that, that we remember that Jesus died for us. We remember that we have life over death and that we remember even in this time that God has hope for us and that we can shine bright through it. So let's take that minute and we prepare and be still before God and remember what he did for us. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, as we prepare for communion right now, let us remember that you got rid of our sin and that you brought us hope through the cross. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now's our time for offering and prayer. We at Parkview, we wanna thank you so much for being a generous church. We have a lot of programs that we're still giving to because you've been so generous, like the Caring Closet, which is gonna come up in a couple of months. It gives school supplies to kids. We have missionaries that we give to. And of course, we're a church, and so we ask you to give even in these uncertain times. And we do understand that it could be tough, but there are some ways that you can still give. You can still write a check and drop it in the mail or bring it by the church. Or if you want something maybe a little more convenient, you can use our text to give or go right to the website and you can give from there as well. Well, now as we enter our time of prayer, what I want us to do is start preparing our hearts and minds for Easter, which is next week. Good Friday, is this coming Friday. And what I want us to do as a church is just a little bit different. What I would like us to do is pray for 24 hours straight on Good Friday. You might be thinking, well, Brian, that seems like a pretty, pretty big task to do. Well, I don't know if it's a big task if we can all kind of break it up together. So what I would like us to do is from 6 a.m. Friday to 6 a.m. Saturday morning is as a church, pray in 15 minute increments through the entire 24 hours a day. And how would we do that? Well, I have a sign up list on signupgenius.com and I'm gonna put the link in the comments section below on Facebook and the link is gonna be here. We're gonna try to send out the link and you just go on there and you sign up for a 15 minute slot. That's all you have to do. You don't have to put an email, but if you put your email in, it'll send you a little reminder. But I want us to be a church that is known for prayer. That everything we do, we go to God first. And so this Friday, for 24 hours straight, I want us to know that we are all praying, that we prepare our hearts, we prepare our minds for Easter. So would you do that for me? All right, here we go, and now we're gonna pray. Dear Heavenly Father, right now I wanna pray for our service. I want to pray for Mark as he preaches. I want to pray for 
all of our people is that that we be prepared to hear your word and to let it work through us. And God, this Friday, I ask as a church that we rise up together and that we talk to you for that 24 hours straight. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for giving us the hope through this time. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Another way you can give is by going to myparkviewchurch.com and clicking on giving. Once you're at the next page, you can choose a fund you would like to give to and a dollar amount. And then you can choose whether you'd like to give by card or by bank account. And just hit submit. Well, everybody, it's a pretty exciting day today because we get to baptize Alana Katura Heinrich, and I'm pretty excited about this. Alana came to us um, probably about a week ago, and she came into my room, and Tracy says, Alana's got something that she wants to talk to us about. She says, I want to get baptized, and it was so exciting because she, <laughs> she was smiling and had to ear to ear and she was so excited about the whole thing. So Lana, can I ask why do you want to be baptized? Because I want to follow Jesus Christ. Awesome. Well, we're going to ask your confession of faith. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Son of God? Yes. You want to give him your life? Mm-hmm. Live for him all the time? Yes. <laughs> And right now what we're doing is we're, you're showing everybody that you want to live for him, that you want to die like Jesus. You don't actually have to die, which is a good thing, but you want to be raised as a new person. It's a whole new life for you. So now oh, we're going to do this. So I want you to put your hand. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, good day. I wish you could be here with me today, but <clears throat> as it is, I'm recording a sermon for you. And I really miss you. I, I got to tell you that, that I miss being in church. I miss the, the fellowship time. I miss the time of singing together, praying together. I miss seeing you interact with each other. It's a strange time. We'll get through this. Won't be long. We'll be back together. But in the meantime, thanks for joining us. Uh, and I want to appreciate again, our, our tech team is putting all this together. You probably know by now that Lana Katura. Heinrich was baptized into Christ this week. I am so excited about that. Let me just say this. If you'd like to be baptized, you can. You can do it anywhere, anytime, and anybody can baptize you. It doesn't have to be an ordained preacher. Anybody can do that. But I would appreciate if you do that. Would you please send a video to us so we can rejoice with you? We're in the Gospel of John. A series of sermons called The Hard to Believe, looking at people in the Gospel of John who struggled to come to faith in Christ Jesus. Today we're looking at a guy who is passive, and his name is Pilate. Sometimes we're passive, we just fail to see the importance of what's going on. And many people are, I think maybe even many men, are passive towards their families. They're, they're so engaged in work, so enthralled in that, trying to make a living, and those are good things. You have to do that. But sometimes family can take a back seat because we get our priorities a little mixed up. We're passive about the most important things. And we end up giving first allegiance to secondary causes. Sports. You know, you can live without sports. I have for three weeks. You probably have too. And it's difficult. I like having them back, but they're really not that necessary. Certain things in life are so important that you have to make a decision regarding them. And I know you don't want to make decisions. Are you going to save any money for retirement? No, I don't want to think about it right now. Well, when you say, I don't want to think about it right now, I'm going to put it off. You've made a decision about saving for retirement that you're saying, I'm not going to do it right now. How about exercise? I tell my kids, they ask me, are you doing any exercise? I tell them, well, when I lose 10 more pounds, I'll be able to get out there and do something, which means for today, I've decided not to do anything. The most important decision you make in life is the one you make about Jesus Christ 
And that decision affects everything else in your life. When faced with that decision, Pilate was passive. So let's, let's dive into John chapter 18. Judas has gone uh, to the authorities. He's come back with him. He's betrayed Jesus. He comes back to the Garden of Olives uh, to find Jesus and arrest him. John 18, 4. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Now, when Jesus asks a question, he's not looking for information. He, he knows the answer. What he's trying to get them to do is figure out, what are you really looking for? What, will, what is, are you after? What are you seeking? And what will you do with me? He's forced them to, to acknowledge who he is. Where do you stand with me? Are you with me or are you against me? John 18, 5. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I'm he, Jesus said. Judas who betrayed him was standing with them. As Jesus said this, said, I am he. They all drew back and fell to the ground. That should be clue number one, that you shouldn't arrest Jesus. They come and say, who are you? We're, we're looking for Jesus. Jesus says, that's me. And boom, he knocks them backwards by his word. They're knocked back on their tail ends. And, and they should have realized what's going on. Verse 7, once more, Jesus asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. Since I'm the one you want, let these others go. Now, that word, let these others go, another translation is, he released them, released these others. It's the same word used for forgiveness. We're going to see all through this chapter the, the principle of substitution, that Jesus takes our place. And he says to the, the apostles, let the apostles go. I'm their substitute. You can take me. Verse 9, he did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those whom you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering that the Father has given me? Now, Peter wasn't like Zorro, just aiming for an ear. He was trying to split this guy's coconut wide open. And Jesus, the Bible says, reaches down, I think it's in the Gospel of Luke, reaches down, grabs the man's ear out of the dirt, and puts it back on his face. And what a strange experience for Malchus. He's got to be thinking, did, did that really happen? Are, are my ears the same height? I, I can't tell. That is exactly what happened. That should be clue number two. It's a bad idea <clears throat> to try to arrest Jesus. He said, shall I not drink from the cup of suffering? Again, the idea of substitution. In the Old Testament, they talked about drinking the dregs and drinking the cup of God's anger. John 18, verse 12. The soldiers, uh, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus and tied him up. First, they took him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Caiaphas was the one who told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. Again, the idea of substitution. This is back in John chapter 11, as Jesus was, they were trying to arrest Jesus, and Caiaphas made that prophecy, it's better for one man to die than for all the people. Verse 19, inside the high priest began asking Jesus and about his followers and what he had been teaching them. Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I preach regularly in the synagogues and the temple where the people gather. I've not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. And Jesus simply says, you know, why ask me what I teach? This is no big secret. There's no YouTube video out there that I'm embarrassed about. I've said things publicly. You know what I teach. Verse 32, 22. One of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way you answer the, the priest, the high priest? He demanded. Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. If I'm speaking the truth, why are you beating me? Now, I have to admire Jesus' restraint. And they say, is this the way you treat the high priest? And Jesus could have said, the high priest, I am the ultimate high priest. I set up the priesthood. And you better be looking out when I come back in the clouds of glory. Verse 28. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. He was taken away the headquarters of the Roman governor. Now, this is Pilate. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them, and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. <clears throat> They're so twisted. Their religion says you can't go into a Gentile's house during Passover, or you can't eat the Passover. And so they keep the letter of the law, all the while they're trying to kill Jesus, the Son of God. The charge, verse 29, Pilate the governor went out to them and asked, What's your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if you weren't a criminal, they retorted. The charge? Well, he's a lawbreaker. He's a criminal. Now, what's the actual charge? No, he's just a criminal. He's a lawbreaker. 
What will Pilate do with Jesus? That's the question. What will you do with Jesus? That's the greatest question of all. Pilate's conflicted. He has some, some insight. He knows that Jesus is an innocent man, that he's on trial mainly because the Jews are jealous of him. He had a code of honor. He didn't want to condemn an innocent man. Nobody does. But he had his career to think about. See, Pilate was a politician. He was the Roman governor of the Jewish people. All that Rome wanted from Pilate was keep the peace in the area and collect the taxes. Everything will be fine. But Pilate had two strikes against him already. When he became governor, he went to the temple. He put a a banner of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor, on top of the temple. And the Jews were hot. Talk about blasphemy against the Jehovah God. How can you put another image in, in the temple of God? And they, they, re, they rioted. And Pilate came and said, if you don't quit this riot, if you don't get into subjection to me, I'm going to kill every one of you. To which the Jews said, kill us. And they laid down there in the temple and said, if you want to kill us, you can kill us. Well, Pilate back, back down, riot number one, strike number one. Strike two, Pilate wanted to build an aqueduct, didn't have the money, so he just went to the Roman, to the Jewish temple and stole the money out of the temple. Again, the Jews rioted. This time, Pilate got undercover soldiers to go in and try to take care of him. He killed many of the Jews that day. Strike number two, and by now, the Jews hated Pilate, and the Romans were annoyed with him. So when he faces a decision about Jesus... In order to save his skin, he offers five compromises, and we make the same kind of compromises. Today. The first one is this. He just tried to avoid the decision. Pilate didn't want to take the unpopular decision, so he looked for an alternative. He simply tried to avoid the decision. Verse 31, then you take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told them. You judge him. I don't want to mess with it. I, don't. I hear people today say, I don't even think about religion. I don't want to think about Jesus. I don't want to think about eternity. Well, that works for a while. But you know, the death rate is still hovering close to 100% for humans, even without the virus. I hear people say, talking about cremation or burial, if I die, can I just tell you, you're going to die. Some people want to avoid church. They, they, they might hear something disturbing. And this man, Pilate, says, I don't want to even think about Jesus and who he is. Verse 31, he continues, only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. I mean, they said, we brought him to you because you can kill him. We're not allowed to kill him. Now, technically, that's true. The Jews were not allowed to, to stone anybody, but they often did. You get to Acts chapter uh, 7 and 8, and there Stephen is stoned. It, it's illegal, but Pilate is in no position to counteract the Jews or to give him any trouble over this, and they could have easily done this, but they want to put it on Pilate. They were afraid of the people. Jesus was popular. They didn't want to stand against the people either. Verse 32. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. All this is playing out according to God's plan. Remember, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And in Matthew 20, he said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They'll hand me over to the Romans. They'll flog me. They'll mock me. They'll whip me. I'll be crucified. On the third day, I'll rise from the grave. Caiaphas and the Jews, they want Jesus crucified. The reason is this. Deuteronomy 23 and verse Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, he who is hanged on a tree is cursed by God. And they, they reason, if we can get Jesus to be crucified instead of stoned, then he'll die that way, and everybody will know that he wasn't God's man. He was cursed. But here again is the idea of substitution. He was cursed, but it's my curse. He took your curse and my curse, and that's why he died. So he tried to avoid the decision. That won't work. The next thing that Pilate does, he tries to trivialize the decision. So what? It, this is no big deal. Listen to John chapter 18, verse 33. Pilate went back to the headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. Jesus replied, Is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted, Your own people. And the leading priest brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, So you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came to the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. They went out again to the people and told them, he's not guilty of any crime. He's no threat to Rome. He has no political aspirations. This is not a big deal. A lot of people today know there's a God, but they don't really think it's that big a deal. They're not 
Atheists are not agnostics, they're apatheists, according to what J.D. Greer has termed apathy. Yeah, there's a God, but so what? Who cares? It doesn't really matter to me. And again, that may work for a while. You can trivialize until something happens. You go to a funeral, maybe a funeral of somebody you're very close to, or maybe the funeral of somebody your age. And it just smacks your face. It's surreal, like, this is what I'm faced with. I tell people that when I was a young preacher in my 20s, I could preach funerals that didn't bother me because I just figured old people in their 50s and 60s die. But now it bothers me when I bury people that are my age. Or maybe what gets your attention is the virus. And the virus, somebody, one newscaster said, the virus has gone viral. Well, actually, that's exactly what they do. And you suddenly realize how fragile life is. Or maybe you have a moment of conviction and you suddenly realize, you know what, I'm, I'm just not doing what's right. I need to change my life. Or Maybe you have this feeling of hopelessness and despair, and what does my life really matter anyway? Or you get a sense of who Jesus is and how unique he is. Or maybe you like the friends of Malchus, you see Jesus work in other people's lives, you go, I, I think I, I need that. Charles Spurgeon said, Trifle not with Christ, whose hands and feet were nailed to the accursed tree for sinners such as you. Trifle not with his precious blood, for that's your only hope of redemption. Trifle not with the Holy Spirit, for if he should leave you to perish, your cause would be hopeless. Trifle not with the gospel. What would the lost and hell not give to you? another gospel proclamation? The devil does not trifle. He earnestly seeks your destruction. God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, they're not trifling with you, and I'm not trifling with you either. Pilate didn't give the decision the weight that it deserved. He trifled with it. He made it a trivial thing. There's a third compromise we offer. We try to put the decision off on somebody else. What follows in John 18, 38 from Luke Chapter 23 just says this. When Pilate realized that Jesus was from Galilee, he sent Jesus to the Herod, the Galilee emperor, the Galilee Roman governor up that way. Let him decide. Well, it wasn't long before Herod had enough and sent him right back. And You can't put off this decision about Jesus. You can't avoid him. And then Pilate had another brainstorm. Stroke of genius, John 18, verse 39. You have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like him to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Now, this idea of Barabbas, uh, this was actually Pilate's idea. You read the other Gospels. He's the one who suggested that Barabbas be the one put up. Jesus or Barabbas, who would you like to release? That is a ridiculously easy choice. With the virus going through our country right now, in many places, they're releasing prisoners. Now, in most places, they release nonviolent prisoners. In St. Louis, I've been watching a little news over there. They've released some very violent offenders who were waiting, didn't have the bail money. They just let them go. Who would you like to release on bail? A, a rapist, a murderer, an armed robber, or a guy who heals the sick, feeds the hungry, is gentle with children, and teaches some things that the authorities aren't very fond of? It should be ridiculously easily. Jesus or Brabus, your choice. Again, here's the idea of substitution. Jesus the innocent takes the guilty man's cross. And J.D. Greer suggested it probably is so that the third cross on the hill that day had Barabbas' name on it. They put it up for Barabbas. By the way, the word Barabbas, the name Barabbas, comes from two Greek words. And bar meaning son of, like Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. And Abba means father. And Barabbas just means son of a father. It, it means every one of us. He took Jesus took his place and took our place as well. Pilate tried to transfer the decision to Herod and the people, but it was his decision to make, and it is your decision to make. It's not anybody else's decision, but yours, what you do with Jesus. It's not your spouse's decision. Listen, it's not your parents' decision. I, I know parents want to push the right way, but it's not their decision. Listen, teenagers, you're in high school, you're thinking about things, and soon you'll be in college. You better build your faith now because when you get there, your parents' faith won't do you any good. It'll be your faith. Don't put the decision off on somebody else. Here's a fourth compromise. We try to make a partial decision. We just read in John 18, 38 that Pilate said, I know this man is not guilty. And then he does the insanely wicked thing, chapter 19. Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Now, if you saw the Passion of the Christ, you have some idea of what this was about. The 39 lashes with a whip uh, killed a lot of people. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, 
I'm going to bring him out to you now. But understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here's the man. Pilate says twice, Jesus is innocent, he's not guilty. He has him flogged, mocked, slapped. That partial decision is the most wicked of all. And churches are full of people who are making a partial decision for Christ. They say, I'm going to attend church, I believe, but I'm just not going to be baptized. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Or I'm going to become a Christian, but I'm not going to let it change my daily life. Or I'll attend church, but I'm not going to try to influence my friends. That's only going part way. Or I'm going to bring my boyfriend to church, but we're not going to control what we do sexually according to what God says in his word. Or I'll serve on a ministry team, but don't even think about asking me to go on a mission trip. Is there any part of your life where Jesus isn't welcome? Finally, I wonder, please everybody, with a partial decision, he pleased nobody. Here's the final compromise. We try to refuse personal responsibility for the decision. Pilate finally realized he couldn't save himself and save Jesus. So he permitted the injustice and he blamed everyone else for it. John 19, verse 16, Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. Matthew adds this, that Pilate's wife sent word to him, don't do anything to this man. I suffered much in a dream last night, a nightmare. Let this man go. And Matthew also records this, that before all those people, Pilate got out a wash basin and a towel. Uh, he was being coronavirus uh, protective, I suppose. But he washed his hands and he said, hey, I wash my hands this. Let his blood be on your hands and not on mine. And the people said, that's fine with us. But it doesn't work that way. You're responsible for your choice with Jesus. And you can't blame your lack of faith on your upbringing or the pain you've had. It ultimately is your decision. The key concept in the chapter, Jesus is our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took my condemnation and I get his commendation. John Stott said, before we can see the cross as something done for us, we must first see it as something done by us. Now, the question is, what will you do with Jesus? Adoniram Judson was the first uh, American missionary. He left America in February of 1812 to go to South Asia. He went to Burma, where no one else had gone with the gospel. And when he left there, by the way, his wife and several of his children died of sickness in Burma. But when he left there, there were 7,000 Burmese Christians left behind. But I want to talk about the decision he made, first of all, to follow Jesus. He, he was born and raised in a Christian home. He was a Christian early on. But he went to Brown University. And while he was there, he was lured away from the Christian faith, particularly a friend of his named Jacob Eames, who was a philosopher, rejected all religion, including the Bible. Eames ridiculed the Bible and God. And Judson's fragile faith crumbled under Eames' assaults. He kept his loss of faith from his parents. He didn't let him know until his 20th birthday after graduation as the valedictorian of Brown on August 9th, 1808. He announced that day that he was no longer a Christian. He decided to become a playwright. He went to New York to begin that work. He went there, but he was disillusioned. It wasn't as fulfilling as he thought it would be. And one night while traveling in a small village, he spent the night in a local inn. The only room available to him was adjacent to a room where a man was dying. That man cried out in desperation, tormented, deep despair. And because of the man's cries, cries uh, Jetson just couldn't sleep. He began to wonder, is this man prepared for death? That's really all that matters now. Am I prepared for death? His philosophy taught him that death was nothing but a door to an empty pit, nothing beyond that. And he could hear his friend Jacob Eames in his mind saying, really, Judson, you're that weak? Are you really the valedictorian of Brown University, spooked by a little superstitious religion? He was ashamed of his fear. But oh, those groans, they bothered him all night long. Finally, he got some sleep. By morning, he awoke, sunlight filled the room, the despair lifted. He went downstairs and he talked to the person at the desk at the hotel. They said, what about that guy next to me in that room? He was suffering so. And the desk agent simply said, well, he, he's dead. And Judson politely asked, well, do you know who he was? Can we get a hold of his family? And the desk agent said, oh, yes. The young man was from college in Providence. His name was Eames, Jacob Eames. Judson could hardly move. He didn't leave the inn for hours. He later reflected on that moment. He said, lost. In death, Jacob Eames was lost. Utterly, irrevocably lost. Lost to his friends, to the world, to the future. Lost as a puff of smoke is lost in the infinity of air. If Eames' own views were true, 
Neither life nor death had any meaning. But suppose Eames had been mistaken. Suppose the scriptures were literally true and a personal God real. That hell should open up in that country inn and snatch Jacob Eames, my dearest friend and guide, from the next bed, this could not, simply could not be coincidence. Shortly thereafter, Judson came to believe the gospel so strongly he fought the rest of his life to see the gospel go to places in the world where it had never been before. Are you prepared for eternity? That depends on what you do with Jesus. There's an old hymn that says this. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken, what meaneth the sudden call? What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. Someday, your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Greatest question of all time, what will you do with Jesus? Jesus.